still lies to fade in the light western air that blows from the crimson horizon. Once more we tack home with a dry, empty hole, saving gas in the breezes so fair. She's a lovely Cape Islander, old but still sound, but so lost in the long liner shadow. Make and break and make do, but the fish are so few. She won't be replaced should she founder. Now it's hard not to think of before the big war. When the cod were so cheap and so plenty. Foreign trawlers go by now with long seen eyes. Taking all when we seldom take any. And the young folk don't stay with the fishermen's way. Long ago, they all moved to the city. And the ones left behind, old and tired and blind, won't work for a pound or a penny. In Make and Break Harbor, the boats are so few. Too many are pulled up and rotten. Most houses stand empty, old nets hung to dry are blown away, lost, and forgotten. I come from outdoor people. Thank, thanks. I come from outdoor people, fishing people. My family have been on Fogo Island for centuries, and so I started life with everything. I have my family. I had my ocean, I had my rocks, and in fact, I had my very own rock out in the garden, a rock that spoke to me all the time. And I had my Uncle Art, and he lived in the house next to us, much like all the other houses in Joe Bat's Arm, a little tiny wooden house, about maybe 800 square feet. And he was a bachelor, he was my father's brother. And his house was different than all the other houses, because he never actually finished it. And he lived in one tiny little room that had his bed and a stove and a table and a settle and he had exactly one fork and one knife and one spoon <laughs> one bowl one plate and one cup and an extra shirt <laughs> and to me that house was magical because it had uncle art and because it was a refuge from the house of mayhem next door where i lived with my parents and my six brothers and Uncle Art always made sure that I knew that his house was my house. And I visited Uncle Art in his house every day, many, many, many times, every single day of my young life. And it was a pretty wonderful life. Until one day, when I was about five, a very strange boat came into the harbor in Jobat's Arm and tied up at the wharf. Everybody went down. It was like a festival. I didn't realize at the time that this strange boat was the TV boat, or the Christmas seal, as she was called. Of course, that's the thing of legend for Port Newfoundlanders. I also didn't realize that there was a connection between the TV boat and the fact that the very next day I had my very first trip. My dad and I took a different boat to catch a train to go all the way to Corner Brook, and we arrived at a huge building, the biggest building I had ever seen, and probably that he had ever seen. And inside that building, it was all white. And all the people in there were all dressed in white. And it had the strangest smells, smells that hurt your nose. And nothing smelled like fish. And he left me there. And so I cried. I think I cried for a week. I cried until I couldn't cry anymore. And then I realized that I had been exiled, that I had been exiled from where I belonged. And nothing in that sanatorium gave me any comfort. And it seemed to me that my place was forever gone. 
superintendent of the Lark's house was forever lost. And so my life became a question. Why can't I go home? About a year later, my dad came back to get me. And I did come home. And I remember sitting out with a talking rock in the garden and feeling very, very grateful. And then life went on. Until the talk came a few years later in the community about what's going to happen to us. And my dad came home one day from fishing with exactly one fish. And my brothers, all knowing, were talking about, oh, how this place is just going to be the gulls left here. And then things got worse. I came home from school one day, and my dad was burning his boat. It's not a sight you soon forget. And Uncle Ark said, he's off his head. It's not that bad. But it really was that bad because all the fish were gone. And so my brothers all left to work in Toronto. And my dad said, I could finish high school, but that was it. I'd have to go right after because there was nothing left in this place for us. That seemed really bad until I turned 15, at which point it didn't seem so bad at all because when you're 15, the last thing you want is the life of your parents. And as luck would have it, I went that summer to visit my cousins in Grand Falls. Well, that was it. They had a main street, there was a cafe and a shoe store, and most impressive of all to me was the fact that right in their house, they had a refrigerator. And so by the time I came back to Joe Bat's arm, well, it seemed awfully small for the giant that I thought I was becoming. And even Uncle Art seemed a bit old and a bit backward. And Uncle Art's house seemed, well, it was embarrassing. And so my life became a different question. How can I get away from this place? And I did get away. I went to university in Ottawa. Well, that was a shock because my temporary sense of sophistication and superiority that I had after my little trip to Grand Falls in Windsor <laughs> was quickly dashed by all the people in Ottawa who were far more sophisticated than I was. And they had even more things. And I was particularly struck by all the choices everybody had. They could spend an hour deciding what restaurant to go out to. And I wanted to have those choices, and I wanted to fit in, and I wanted to be sophisticated like them. And I wanted to sound like them, which was not easy. And I lived in fear of the question, so where are you from? And I'd say vaguely, out east. This time away, I wasn't exiled. I was actually a fraud. But I was enjoying university and learning all about um, bottom lines and GDP and competitiveness and all the things that from Fogo Island seemed impenetrable. And then a turning point came. News came that Uncle Art was very sick and that I had to come home right away. And so I did come home. And he died. And something in that something in the grief or something in the way the people at home were so open, spirited, something in the constancy of the place, I suddenly felt given back to myself. And I felt I could just go back to being who I'd been all along. And what a great relief that was. Uncle Art left me his house, and he left me $300, which was a huge amount of money to me. And in fact, that $300 was the financial sum of that man's life. So I was 18 years old, I had $300 in my pocket, and I was quite confused about coming and going. But my dad, ever vocal and ever clear, said, you go right back to Ottawa and finish your education. So I did. But I went back to Ottawa a different person. I went back with Joe Bat's arm deeply, deeply, deeply inside me. And this time, the place wasn't my secret shame. It was my secret weapon. And I had a new question, which was, what do I want my life to mean? And so then came work, which was very absorbing. 
My first job paid $14,000 a year. It took me six months to tell my dad what my salary was because I knew that the most he'd ever made in a year was $7,400. But I underestimated him. He was very well adjusted. He was just proud. And then life and work and achievement and opportunity and travel and things and all good things. And I, I enjoyed all of them. But increasingly, I felt something missing. And I found myself reaching out for home and wondering what that rock in the garden would have to say. He used to know everything all those years ago. My dad by now was gone, and Uncle Art's house was falling into the harbor. Not that it was the only falling down house in Jogut's Arm. And so it was hard to know where, where to go with that. By this time, my brothers and I had started a scholarship on Fogo Island. And that turned out to be very educational for us, more maybe than the kids. Because we had a public review of the scholarship. And at that review, a woman stood up and said very sharply, can't you see you're just paying our kids to leave? Can't you do something to make work so people can stay? So that set Alan and Tony and I off on a big think. And of course, central to all that was kept coming back to what would our dad say about this? What would he say we should do? I mean, really, what should we do? And more to the point, perhaps, what could we do? And would he want us to circle back? Did he nudge us out all those years ago, thinking we would actually circle back? And so there were questions. Where does this story want to go? And what's our part in it? So we decided to participate with our place again and to try and do some things, to hold on, to hold on by reaching out and to do what that woman said, to try and do something to make jobs so that people could stay. And so I came home. It took a little while to reconcile my nostalgic idea of home with the reality of home now and of course to reconcile the old dreams and the new dreams. Many things had changed in 30 years, but actually many, many things had stayed the same. The young ones still wanted to leave, but most people just wanted to hold on. And the dead ones were still watching and a place absolutely still remembered. In the early days of being home, I ran into a high school friend who had never left the island. And I was overwhelmed with gratitude to him and people like him who had stayed and kept the lights burning so that the place would be an anchor for me and others like me to circle back and to always know our place. And as you might have guessed, I live in Uncle Art's house now. After 80 years of being one little unfinished room, it's finished. And it has a few more forks and knives than he ever had. And of course it has a refrigerator. And I know he knows, and I hope he likes it. And my mom and dad are across the harbor in the graveyard, and my dad's still nudging here and there. And so for my life, at least, it seems that things have come full circle. I can see the big draggers have stirred up the bay, leaving lobster pots smashed on the bottom. Can they think it don't pay to respect the old ways that make and break men have not forgotten? For we still keep our time to the turn of the tide. And this boat that I built with my father still lifts to the sky. This one longer and I still talk like old friends on the water. In Make and Break Harbor, the boats are so few. Too many are pulled up and rotten. 
Ghost houses stand empty, old nets hung to dry, are blown away, lost and forgotten. Thank you.